Thank you. Please be seated. Now call the third case on this morning's docket. That is case number 101806, State of Kansas v. Shanna R. Friday. May it please the court, my name is Sean Minahan and I'm an attorney at the Kansas Appellate Defender Office representing Shanna Friday. I'd like to request three minutes of rebuttal. Three minutes is granted. I'd like to talk about the first issue and submit the rest on the brief unless this court has questions. The first issue, well, Shanna Friday was convicted of murder. The first issue in our brief is prosecutorial misconduct. If you look at the opening statement of the state, one of the first things that they said was Jerry DeShazer, the alleged victim in this case, was a man known for his generosity, a man known for taking on people when they needed a helping hand, giving them money, blah, blah, blah. The state of Kansas was the first person, was the first party to bring up this question of whether he was a nice guy or a mean guy. And they brought it up in his opening statement. And this continued throughout the trial, this back and forth between whether he was a nice guy when he was drinking and just regularly and whether he was a mean and angry drunk. So during this, not surprising during the closing argument, that the defendant argued that DeShazer was a mean drunk. He was violent when he drank. The state could have rebutted, when they got up on a rebuttal, said, well, the fact that he was a mean drunk, that evidence isn't reliable. Or they could have emphasized the fact that some people said he was nice when he drank. One person said he was nice when he drank. Or they could have argued that it was irrelevant to whether Shanna Friday was guilty of this crime. But they didn't. They chose to basically attack the defendant's theory of defense by saying that they, by arguing this, took away the dignity of DeShazer. And they also argued for the jury to convict the defendant because, to give him his dignity back. These are clearly things outside of the elements of the defense in this case. Whether the defendant's dignity was taken away at this trial has no relevance to whether the elements have been met. Because of that, this is misconduct. The next question is whether this shows gross, this is gross and flagrant, and whether it shows ill will. Well, I think if you look at the entire trial, how they pushed that he was a nice guy and how this became such a huge issue, and you look at the statement, this wasn't one comment about this. This was a thought out argument to the jury. This was premeditated on her part. This argument that you have to give his dignity back to him by convicting him was thought out. And I think that that shows ill will and it's gross and flagrant. And even if it didn't show that it was gross and flagrant, it wasn't harmless. The whole issue in this case was whether the defendant was the initial attacker or whether DeShazer was an initial attacker. If the jury would have felt, believed that DeShazer was an initial attacker, then they could have found Ms. Friday not guilty. Instead, they asked the jury to convict based upon the victim's dignity and not upon the facts and the elements of the offense. Unless this court has any questions. Yeah, I want to ask you about the issue on, are you done with your prosecutorial misconduct? Move to your sixth issue on the identical offense issue. How do you address our Sandberg case where we said identical offense doctrine doesn't apply to lesser included offenses? Well, this isn't really a lesser included offense. It's almost a, because it's not like you have... Involuntary manslaughter is not a lesser included offense of second degree. Aren't they all degrees of homicide? Yeah, but... Under the definition, degrees of the same crime. But I haven't read Sandberg. Is that recent? Does one of us cite that? So I can't specifically address Sandberg because I haven't read that case. But 
the typical lesser included offense case is one where you have elements A, B, and C in the greater, and then elements A and B become a lesser, and that's not what you have. That's, a, that's only one. That's only one of the definitions, right. one subsection. The other subsection is a lesser degree of the same same crime. Right. And, and I think we've, we've pretty well said homicide has varying degrees uh, and that involuntary would be one degree of, of homicide as would second degree. All right. Well, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> and would you address whether you can aid and abet a reckless act? I think that there's a uh, there's a dispute between the two cases that I raised and then Garza. And uh, I don't know how you have, an, have a specific intent to aid somebody else's reckless act. How do you, you make that jump? Um, and I think you have to look at the cases of that uh, that I put out, the ones in the 90s, that talk about how um, you just can't aid in a bet uh, somebody else's reckless act. Do you have a specific question? It, well, it depends on whether you're talking about a reckless, unintended result versus the initial act. Right. Yeah, I don't... My argument would be that it doesn't matter. It's uh, like you can, like, I think you're arguing that, well, you can specifically intend to aid somebody in whatever, she, she DUI. Could, she could have aided and abetted uh, uh, in, in beating up the victim right. and attacking the victim, but not had the intent to kill. It would have been a reckless killing, but the act that led to it, she could have aided and abetted the But we usually think of aiding and abetting as to the elements of the crime, not to the underlying act. So, anything? I'd like, I'd like to go back to the area Justice Johnson introduced to you, and that was his question about involuntary manslaughter versus second degree. Uh-huh. Uh, that obviously was one of the issues that was addressed by the Court of Appeals. Do you have anything further to tell us on how the Court of Appeals got that wrong? Um, well, I think that the Court of Appeals argument was this was a lesser degree of the same crime. And I would still argue that this isn't a lesser degree of these are separate elements. And if, if you are guilty of the greater degree, um, that's not going to happen. Um, no, it's so hard when uh, Sandberg hasn't been, you know, brought up until the argument. Um, uh, unless this court has any questions. Any further questions? Thank you, counsel. <clears throat> May it please the court, Charles Branson, District Attorney for Douglas County for the Pelley State of Kansas. I would uh, briefly uh, respond to the first issue with regard to misconduct. Um, I believe uh, the statement was that the misconduct or the the line of uh, of argument started in opening. Um, I would, uh, based on my recollection, direct the court to look at the voir dire in this case. I believe um, it was raised in voir dire by the defense attorney that. Well, what uh, what difference does that make? I mean, if, if the issue was first brought up, does that give carte blanche to the prosecutor to make improper statements in closing? No, it would not. I mean, the simple matter is that if it's deemed to be improper, then it's improper. And I would agree to that. Um, the context, though, is that it is a response and not uh, this well-thought-out tirade, as would be suggested. It is a response to a trial that was very replete with accusations that this was somehow not a worthy victim. Um, and I think uh, uh, when you go back and analyze the, the closing arguments that this was done in rebuttal, uh, it was, as the Court of Appeals pointed out, one page and 30 pages of, of transcripts. Uh, this wasn't a well thought out. It may have been well said, uh, but it wasn't a well thought out planned action to turn around and, and, and make this point. Do you agree um, it's outside the wide latitude so we can get past that point and wallow in these others? <laughs> 
I would agree that's close. Um, outside, I, I think, is, is questionable. I, I think it is close in the sense that um, did it have an opportunity to divert the jury's attention? Yes, I will concede that. Um, uh, was it designed to do that or was it calculated to do that? No, what, I would not. What was the purpose then? Well, What's the purpose of saying give the victim his dignity back? What was the purpose of that within the context of helping the jury look at the evidence and determine whether it proved beyond a reasonable doubt? In that context, what was the purpose of that statement? Like I said, I, I concede it's questionable, Your Honor. Um, what I would also go along with, though, to that is you also have to look at what we're asking the jury to convict on. This is a situation where we're commenting on recklessness, the extreme indifference to the value of human life in this case. Um, not only were we looking at just the fact that this is a person that was beat, who ultimately died because of all these actions, but the conditions in that he was, was left. They beat this person who was left to bleed to death in a chair. The chair was soaked with blood. The blanket that was thrown over his head was soaked with blood. He had to crawl down a hallway all while these people were, were available in the house. Um, this is a situation that this death occurred um, when there's an extreme indifference to the value of human life. And I think it's a comment that also goes towards that, although I, I agree to the initial statement of uh, what did you know, giving back his dignity have to, to do with that, but I think it's also a comment on the nature of the crime itself and how the crime was committed. Do you see a difference in these comments from those that we've already found to be improper where the prosecutor will say, you know, make sure this little girl knows that she did the right thing by turning in the, the defendant? I, mean, I don't see a difference. That's, that's kind of why I wanted to get past this first element and just concede it and, and get into the rest <clears throat> of it. I, I've already conceded it. It's, it's extreme close. You've extreme, well, well, we got to get it over the line. <laughs> that's, that's, that's our problem. <laughs> well, maybe I don't want to give that up, but um, I mean, for, for the sake of argument, yes, it, it's, it, it, is, it is an argument of that nature that could have the potential of diverting the jury's uh, thought process, and, and therefore, because it is of that nature, um, it probably shouldn't have been set. Can you tell us why it's not reversible error? Well, in looking at the, the case, it's not reversible error because I do think it is a small portion of the, the closing argument. Um, it's not gross or flagrant. As again, as I said, it was one page and 30 pages of, of closing argument. It was done in rebuttal. It wasn't designed with the purpose of uh, attempting to you know, restore justice. This wasn't a Tosh type argument. Can, um, can you, I hate to interrupt, could you respond to opposing counsel's argument that this was a quote, thought out, unquote, argument? Even, well, even even though it appeared in rebuttal closing argument, um, I can try to address that again. I mean, the reality of it is, it is uh, rebuttal. Um, the uh, you know, I don't think there was any uh, intent to write this down and put in your pocket and whip it out at the last second during the, the rebuttal or the closing arguments uh, in this matter. It was a matter that was brought up. It was spurred on by the fact that counsel in their closing indicated that this is a very mean drunk, uh, called him a mean drunk again, um, kept and enjoyed the, the uh, company of crack addicts. Um, you know, defense, quite frankly, did what the prosecution can't went on an assassination attempt of the, the victim in the matter to paint the victim as somebody, quite frankly, not worthy of, of being a victim. And... Uh, I think it was a natural, albeit uh, potentially Im improper comment to say that, but uh, I think it was a natural reaction based upon what was said in closing by defense counsel. You understand that we do not uh, forgive a sin of this nature, even though it was done in response to what defense counsel had said? I I understand that completely, Your Honor. Um, again, I think that's where you go on to the rest of the analysis of, of looking at this, and, and you have to weigh whether it was gross or flagrant, um, uh, whether there was ill will involved, um, and what the other evidence in light of the case was. Um, I think the evidence in this case was overwhelming. Um, it was very clear, and I think the, uh, 
the comments uh, did little to persuade the jury as verdict in this case. Good. If you're done with that issue, would you revisit the issue Justice Johnson raised with your opposing counsel? The um, identical offense yes. issues? I think just simply put, um, really what we're talking about here is, is the fact, and I think the Court of Appeals pointed out, that the, um, you know, if, if the, the law provides individuals may act together in commission of a crime based upon their depraved indifference and reckless conduct, uh, in this instance, the giving assistance or encouragement to one who is known, um, who is known that will be engaging in that kind of conduct is, is really kind of what we're looking at. The fact that she uh, was an aider and better um, under any scenarios, any of the facts, uh, the three different scenarios given by the witnesses in this case, she participated. She either was egging on the others um, by her own admissions, uh, the others parted. She went in and delivered three blows to the victim herself. I'm sorry, was this in response to the issue of identical offense doctrine, or is this the aiding and abetting issue? Are you well, trying to building a bridge between the two? I, I may be overlapping just a little bit. I apologize. Um, the The difference here, though, is the the um, the the killing under circumstances that manifest an extreme difference to, to human life. There is an additional element there uh, for, the, for the overlapping. So the fact that uh, all the evidence indicates that there was some but additional thing. The additional element is the increased level of recklessness. I mean, the only difference between the two is how reckless the person is, really, isn't it? Yes. I, How much disregard do you have for uh, the consequences? I, I believe so. I mean, the, the, uh, they so. both require the unintentional killing, but the reckless second inquires further that it has to be done in circumstances that manifest an extreme difference, uh, not just merely recklessly, but it has to be shown the extreme difference. There's no more questions. Do you have any further presentation for us, counsel? I'd rest on our brief for the other matters, Your Honor. Very good. Any questions of counsel? Thank you. Thank you. I just want to point out that saying the defendant is uh, engaging in a character assassination of the victim is like saying that the state is engaging in a character um assassination when they charge somebody and try to convict them. The only thing that the defense was doing was presenting evidence that DeShazer was the aggressor. And they were doing that by showing that he was a mean drunk. And so that's nothing, uh, there's nothing outside the, the latitude of a defense attorney uh, there. There's nothing inappropriate he did there. He was representing his client and presenting his case. That's not a character assassin uh, assassination. That's a defense theory and a defense. So I disagree with the, the prosecutor on that. Unless it's, it's a defense theory that because of a person's personality, you can tie them to the chair and beat them? No, it's a What's, the what, defense what is, well, the defense's theory is that he was the one that attacked the uh, victim or it's the defense's theory that the is the one that attacked uh, my client. And his, whether he was aggressive when he was drunk and physical when he was drunk is highly, real, uh, highly probative on whether uh, the defense is right. And uh, you just have to look at Buffalo Head's testimony to see that, uh, that. And what does hanging out with crack addicts have to do with that? Well, uh, th with drugs, you have a uh, a violent group. I mean, there's no, there's no. Uh, I don't think there's any dispute that when you have illegal drugs around, that there's a violence. There can be violent people. Can be violent. So it does go to uh, DeShazer's. Uh, uh, how he was acting that night. And it's not, it wasn't a proper by the defense attorney. And is there a proper rebuttal to that? Yeah, that, uh, that 
that that evidence that he's mean when he's drunk isn't reliable that uh, we have put on evidence that he's nice when he's drunk, that it doesn't matter that he's mean or not. Those are the rebuttals. That's the things that they could have presented on their uh, closing. But instead, they chose to go, well, he, you just need to give him his, his by raising his defense, he's uh, attacking the victim again. And you need to give his dignity back by uh, convicting him. That's totally improper, and it was highly prejudicial, and it was thought out. Yeah. Unless this court has any questions. I, I do. Okay. Uh, we would agree that the level of reckless conduct um, <laughs> uh, between the second degree and involuntary is, is different, and we do require that that hair be split uh, as to whether the recklessness was... Uh, um, um, you know, and uh, recognizing the imminent danger and, and having total disregard for it. So why why doesn't that make a difference well, it's, in the elements? Why they aren't identical <clears throat> if we have a mens rea that that's different? Well, they are identical in this situation. Any time that you have a conviction of reckless second you have a conviction of this crime. And it's be not because it has lesser elements. It's because the lesser, this uh, voluntary manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, um, incorporates all, uh, well, because the statute doesn't include it in there, it uh, therefore incorporates it in the same. That's well, the only answer I have, well, Judge. That's, Justice. that's like saying every time you steal $20,000, you've, committed the offense of stealing a thousand dollars but this one incorporates it uh they have a specific list of inherently violent crimes and this one isn't included in it if the state if the prosecutor if the legislature across the street wanted to include this in an inherently violent crime statute they could have but because they didn't it's uh it's it's incorporated and the merger Merger doctrine doesn't apply because we have a Court of Appeals case that says it doesn't? Merger doctrine. On, on the, the inherently dangerous crime, does it merge? Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Where gonna, unless, is that, is that it? Unless anybody... Justice Ness? Well, I was going to take you back to an earlier question I'd asked. Okay. Uh, and that was where, among other things, the Court of Appeals had gotten their decision wrong. And, on which, uh, which issue? Uh, on this last issue okay. about uh, identical offenses. And I'd, I'd like to read something from their decision to okay. see what your response, if any, might be. And I grant you they had given a number of reasons why they were rejecting the argument. And this is one I'd like you to uh, focus on. It says, adoption of the defendant's interpretation of the statutes would not be reasonable and sensible to effect legislative design and intent. Clearly, the legislature intended to impose a greater penalty for the greater degree of recklessness required to prove culpability for unintentional second-degree murder. And then this is the part in particular. The defendant's interpretation would essentially eliminate unintentional second-degree murder as an offense. Do you have a response to that? You know, you could argue the same thing with uh, the pr cases we've had previously with, uh, uh, with the drug cases on manufacture. You know, but... You know, it's this not this court's job to to fix uh, the legislature's uh, mistakes. Uh, if they if they have the same elements, and uh, the defendant should get the lesser sentence. Very good. Any further questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.